We'll go ahead and open up your Bibles to Mark 16. We're going to look at one verse in Mark 16, which is verse 16, and then we'll flip over to Romans chapter 6. Our ecclesiastical schematic series today, we've arrived to water baptism. So we're going to look at the doctrine of baptism and what that means for us. Mark 16, let's stand together for the reading of God's word. Picking it up there in verse 16, and then we'll flip to Romans. These are the words of God. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Let's pray. Our Father and Holy God, prepare our hearts to accept your word. Silence in us any voices but your own, so that we might hear your word and also do it. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. The subject of baptism may very well be the most disputed doctrine in modern church history, and certainly since the arrival of the Anabaptists in the 16th century. So for four or five hundred years now, this has been a hotly contested position on who should be baptized, when they should be baptized, those sorts of things. And part of the reason there is confusion on baptism today is because there is some level of confusion on our understanding of covenant theology. What do we do with the covenant that God has made? How does that express itself? There's confusion on covenant theology. There's confusion on the relationship between the visible and invisible church. And and what does that even mean, right? And there's confusion on the relationship between our hearts and our physical bodies. What is it that makes you, you, your soul, your heart and soul, if you will, and that, how is that related to your physical body? And I'm, I would say that if we do not understand the integral nature of these topics and how they go together, you know, how you're not just a soul trapped in this physical body, that's a Plato concept, it's not biblical Christianity, but if you don't understand the integral nature of those relationships, then you won't, you won't, uh, you won't arrive at the correct theology of baptism. So your view of baptism actually is related to your view of the human body, it's related to covenant, it's related to the church. Now the Lord Jesus Christ instituted two sacraments, two sacraments. Now the Catholic Church has seven Protestants have two. Some Protestants said three, anointing the sick, but generally speaking, it's been understood that there are two basic sacraments. We have the Lord's Supper and baptism. Um, the, there's a reason why the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, puts marriage as a sacrament, and that's because the understanding of sacrament is related to the word mystery, as we'll see in a second. And Paul, in Ephesians 5, talks about this mystery of marriage pointing to Christ and and the church. Um, But that's their reasoning. We would just see that not, Protestants don't view it the same way. Now, let's start with the word sacrament. The word sacrament itself can be confusing to people. The origin of the word comes from the Latin, which referred way back when, it referred to the total amount of money that was deposited by two parties in litigation. So if you were the, uh, the, uh, the accuser and the accused, uh, those two parties coming, the plaintiff, defendant, you would bring the money and you would essentially set it before the judge. And once the court made a determination, whoever won the case got the money. Um, so that's kind of how that word was used. The money was rewarded after that. But that understanding of the word sacrament shifted once Christianity became more ubiquitous. It later became associated with a soldier who pledged his allegiance to the commander, the Roman Roman leader, the army officers. And so that eventually, though, that shifted again to the word sign and seal and mysteries. And so the word sacrament has a lot of history to it. 
it's developed in its understanding, uh, and especially as the Christians, um, even way back to the time of Augustine, started thinking through what are the implications of this. This is where that word comes from. Now, Louis Burkhoff, he defines sacrament in this way, and I think this is a brilliant definition. But he says, a sacrament is a holy ordinance instituted by Christ in which, and this is somewhat long, so you may not want to write it down, but if you can ask me later. A sacrament is a holy ordinance instituted by Christ in which by sensible signs, sensible signs, so water in the case of baptism and then bread and wine in the case of the Lord's Supper, these signs... The grace of God in Christ, of course, is present. The sensible signs, the grace of God in Christ, they're centered on him. And the benefits of the covenant of grace, so what do you get being in the member of the covenant of grace? Well, you get Christ, you get forgiveness. All of that, are rep those things are represented, sealed, and applied to believers, and these in turn give expression to their faith and allegiance to God. So one of the ways you prove your allegiance to King Jesus is by being baptized and then taking the Lord's Supper. That's what the word sacrament means. The, there are things that are represented, things that are sealed to you, things that apply to you as a believer in doing these certain, these rituals, if you want to call them that. Now, I think that's a solid definition, but we might add something from another theologian, Abra Kell. He said this, the sacraments are seals of the covenant of grace and are intended for partakers of the covenant alone, as each family is distinguished by its own coat of arms or seal, the church is likewise distinguished by the sacraments. So some family traditions, you have a coat of arms, a seal of sorts, and, and now in, in the church, these are the things that are applied uh, to you. For, uh, for Abrakel, he says, Sealing is the imprinting of one's coat of arms engraven in a signet upon something. So it could be like a ring where you, on a letter, you would seal it with wax, and that's how you sealed the letter. That's kind of what a sacrament is doing. And doing so, he says, one, to distinguish one's own property from that of others. So it belongs to you. You have an identification mark. Two, it's to conceal something from others. If you're putting a letter in and you're sealing it, you're keeping it from everybody else. And so you having baptism is a seal in that sense. Three, it's to preserve something in its purity. And four, to assure one of being a partaker of something. He says the Holy Spirit accomplishes this work by the instrumentality of the word in order to engrave his operations in the hearts of believers. So the sacraments, the two sacraments, when they are accompanied by the word of God, the truth that is preached and proclaimed, when, when you are pondering the mysteries of Christ's death for you, when you partake of the Lord's Supper, and we'll get to that in a, in a couple of weeks, but when you do that, you are partaking of something that the Spirit of God is putting and placing in your heart through those means. So there are means to provide God's covenant people with protection with certainty and fortitude. Now, today, the word sacrament sometimes makes people recoil due to its perceived connection with Roman Catholicism. That just sounds like a Romanish word. And I don't personally believe we need to have such apprehension about the word itself. However, I would hasten to add that we need to understand the concept to be a covenantal rite, R-I-T-E. So when I say sacrament, I mean covenantal rite. When, when Roman Catholics say sacrament, they mean something completely different. So I don't think the word needs to be totally chucked out of the window, but I think covenantal right is a proper understanding. So to, to speak of the sacraments, the Lord's Supper and Baptism, in terms of the covenant of grace, is to speak of the union between the sign or the action itself the water, the bread and wine, the sign in itself, and the thing that it signifies or represents. Now, there have been a lot of fights in church history over that. What is, it, what is happening when you partake of the bread in that moment? Is something happening when you take the bread and the wine? Is something happening when water is applied to you in baptism in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? For us, 
we want to see a union between what is actually happening when you're ingesting those elements or receiving them like water and what it is that it represents okay now the bread and wine as things mean something when done a certain way why why when we set aside time to partake of the supper like this what's different than you going home and just making a sandwich what is different about that there's something that's different and we need to know what that difference is the water something we consume on a daily basis the water as a thing means something when it's carried out in a certain way when you take water you go home and drink a glass of water before bed or whatever your your, your routine is you drink water throughout the day and on a hot day especially as it's been here in virginia um, what's to stop you from throwing water on your head and what's is that baptizing yourself <laughs> exactly that's the answer good so we have to we have to know that there is a covenantal right that's attached to this thing so that you throwing water on yourself on a wednesday afternoon when it's 95 degrees is not it's not baptism we can discern the difference between what you did there and what happens when god's people gather like we did last week and had a baptism now roman catholics make the mistake of blurring the distinctions that's why the the, the protestants one of the things they fought over with the catholics was does this turn into the actual body and blood of christ transubstantiation and the catholics would say absolutely we're the mass is crucifying jesus all over again and you partake of him in that way and the Protestants said, well, no, that's not what's happening. Now, so the Catholics blurred the distinction between the thing and what it signifies, whereas the Protestants say, no, we need to keep that in, in, in tandem. Modern evangelicals make the opposite mistake of the Roman Catholics, and they separate the union that they communicate. So baptism is whatever you make it. And the Lord's Supper, they don't treat it, so that maybe they do it, some churches do it once a year, some do it once a quarter. Um, and it's just sort of like, yeah, it's just a thing we do. It doesn't mean anything. So they do the opposite problem with the Catholics. They don't, they, they, it, it's not blurred. It just doesn't matter. It's completely divorced. So we want to make sure we have a healthy a union between the thing and what it represents. Because it does do something. It is meant to be efficacious in some, in some fashion. Now, to refer to them as rites, R-I-T-E-S, is merely to highlight the fact that one they belong to the community the church baptism in the lord's supper is given by christ to the church and that's what we mean by a right r-i-t-e two they are important to the life and vitality of the community it does matter that we take the lord's supper as the people of god and it belongs to us god christ has made it available to us and it represents something powerful for the life of our community and that's what I mean by covenantal right that's what I how I would define sacrament and I think that you could see the errors on both sides and we can come to the middle and say no this is a more biblical approach now in this case as we're talking about baptism baptism is a right of entry into the visible or when we say historical church it's a mark of membership in this regard to participate in a covenantal rite, a sacrament, is to participate in the actual accomplishment of what it is they signify. In other words, the rites themselves do change us. They do change us. They change our status. Baptism changes your status. You are now a member of the kingdom of God, the people of God. All right? So it changes that, and, and it does change us in, in terms of our sanctification taking the Lord's Supper. We could take the bread and the wine and just sit there and do it autonomically without any regard for what it is we're, we're doing. We, we, we must take of it in a way that's consistent with what Christ has told us it represents. Now, rites like this, like these, establish us in a new status. They do what they're meant to do by the Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit uses those things to enact something in us. Uh, it changes our identity, right? They actually do things in the people of God. Baptism changes your identity. 
You've been, you've been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are a different person. You, you are in the covenant now. And yes, people can apostatize from the covenant, but that's for a different time. But it does something. It changes our identity, and it draws us near to Christ. When you partake of the supper, you're drawing near to Christ. John Murray, theologian, said it this way, Hence the sign and seal of baptism can be no pledge or guarantee of to us of that which baptism signifies, except as we are mindful of God's covenant, embrace its promises, discharge its obligations, and lay hold in faith upon the covenant faithfulness of God. Could you grow up in a church, you're baptized as a young child, could you grow up and walk away? Yeah, people do it all the time. I mean, a lot of Americans, I mean, J.I. Packer lamented this in England back in the 19th 1900s of, of how you have a lot of people who have been baptized millions and millions of people baptized but hardly any of them actually attend church and are part of any sort of meaningful community in that regard can you walk away absolutely so faith is what's needed here as well there's a deep connection between faith and trust in what's going on and so you can you can you, you can see the the necessity of word and sacrament they go together. It's the word of God, faith, and the covenant and the sacrament. So baptism, as we'll see today, is the doorway. It's the entry point into the church. If one professes to be a Christian but is not baptized, I would argue he or she hasn't made a true profession. The Bible says, repent and be baptized. So if one is missing the latter part, has he or she given a true confession? He or she may be totally regenerate, and elected by God and going to heaven, absolutely. But has he or she professed correctly? See, baptism is a visible, it's a visible mark of profession. It's God's amen to the work of the Spirit in the life of a believer. Baptism speaks loudly of Christ, which is why we must take great care in appreciating it for the rest of our lives. We'll come back to that. Let's look at our text. Mark 16. This is Jesus speaking. He who has believed, verse 16, and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Now, I will speak more about this in a bit, but for now, we need to see this ending of Mark as being Mark's version of the Great Commission. We read in Matthew 28, this is Mark's version of the Great Commission. And Jesus, in verse 15, instructed the disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So preaching into all the world, all of creation, till the cows come home. The mission is the salvation and discipleship of the nations. That's the mission. We talked about that in this series already. And Jesus adds here that when someone is confronted with the truth of the gospel, because we're supposed to do that, we're supposed to confront people with the truth of the gospel. That word confront sounds cantankerous, but it's not. We're supposed to do that. When that happens, Jesus says, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. And notice that, believed and has been baptized. And this trips people up, but I think the answer is very easy. Clearly, God, Jesus in our text here, our Lord connects salvation with baptism in an indissoluble union. But can it be that merely applying water in a ceremony saves the person? Well, not exactly. We need to make a distinction. The rest of the verse helps us. But he who, has been, he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Whenever you run across scripture, when you're reading it, and you think, wow, this is confusing, try to keep reading, because it usually helps. This part helps us understand the first part. It's important to note that someone who does not believe the gospel preaching shall be condemned because they are already in a state of condemnation. There's no neutrality. John 3 says as much. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world. The, con the world's already condemned. So if somebody doesn't believe, hears the preaching of God's word and doesn't believe it and rejects it, they're condemned. But are they condemned because they didn't believe? No, they're condemned already. And that was the, the unbelief is just a fruit of that. So the preaching merely adds to it. The preaching of the gospel just confirms it. It confirms what was already there. However, in the natural course of events, someone who does believe 
is to be given the sign of water baptism, including the infants of believers. But these things go hand in hand. Yes, someone may become a Christian on his deathbed by confessing the truth. Just think of the thief on, a cro on the cross. Did the thief go to paradise? Yes. Was he baptized? No. So that is something that could happen. But, so yes, you go to heaven, paradise, as it were, without baptism. However, that's the exception. That's not the norm. The normal course of events is baptism. And baptism doesn't simply wash away. And by the way, to back up, baptism is part of the process of discipling the nations. Before we get to teach them to obey all that Christ has commanded, to teach them the law of God, Jesus says in Matthew 28, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And a lot of Christians today, uh, even huge debate on this recently, even on, on the Twitter, um, well, it just means you're baptizing the disciples. No, the Greek construction actually applies to the nations. We're supposed to baptize them. So not just a disciple or two out of every nation, but the whole, the whole thing, the whole shebang. So we have a lot of water to apply, apparently. But baptism doesn't simply wash away the filth of sin, though it does certainly do that. That's what we'll get to in a minute. Baptism is objective. It's objective in the sense that the mark of Christ is placed on that person. The mark of Jesus, the name of the triune God, is placed on that person, making his life or her life set apart in covenant with God, which requires him to live his life in tandem with that which baptism signifies. When you're given baptism, kids, you are to live your life in light of that baptism. It means something important. You have been marked out by God, and your parents are there to help you walk in that into obedience. So this, he or she is under a covenantal vow, whether they meant it or not. They're under a covenantal vow to live obediently. And the Bible does command us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Think about it in terms of marriage. Is it possible for a groom and a bride to go and say, I do, and one of them not actually mean it? Are they married? Whether they meant it or not, they're in covenant. They are married. In God's eyes, they are. And if five years down the road, divorce happens because the husband, in that case, did not actually mean it, it doesn't make the marriage uh, null and void, though there are certain practices even in Catholicism which would allow for such things. But the point is, you are, you are in covenant, and you can break that covenant, should you know. But that just is a mark of apostasy. Flip to Romans 6. We'll pick it up in verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died in, to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Shall we just, if grace is coming, should we just sin? No. You forget something. What did you forget? Your baptism. Here Paul makes the connection between the sign and the thing signified. Baptism is incorporation. Membership in the covenant community, as Paul argues in Galatians and other places as well, that is objective. You are a part of the people of God. They have come through the door, and that baptism is the door. They've come through the door into the household of faith. They're in the community of the faithful. And none of us has glasses that we can put on to say, ah, yes, he or she is truly regenerate. Nobody knows that but God. The secret things belong to him. But we can discern water baptism, can we? Can we discern if somebody has water applied to them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? and they're marked out, they're now part of the household of faith, we can discern that. Can we discern the heart? Not always. We can see the fruit, we don't see the root. It's underground. And that's, that's the distinction we have to make in baptism. Look at verse 3. 
We're baptized into Christ Jesus, into his death. Verse 4 has an even stronger emphasis, which speaks of the instrumentality of water baptism. We were buried, notice the word, through baptism into death. So our death and burial in water baptism gives way to our participation in new life with Christ. Calvin notes this. He says, he rightly makes a transition from a fellowship in death to a fellowship in life. For these two things are connected together by an indissoluble knot, that the old man is destroyed by the death of Christ and that his resurrection brings righteousness and renders us new creatures. So baptism into Christ's death, baptism in his burial, baptism into resurrection, death to life. And baptism is treated here by Paul as being the vehicle by which a transformation happens in the status of the believer. The external water that's applied points to the internal work of the Spirit. Indeed, Paul sees baptism as not just pointing to it, but accomplishing it in some mysterious fashion. It is taking place in that moment when the water is applied in the triune name. In baptism, we put on Christ Jesus and our baptism is for that very purpose. And thus, we are unified with Christ in death, burial, and resurrection. And obviously, I've mentioned this already, but obviously people, someone can walk away from this and apostatize from the covenant. But we have to remember that circumcision for Jacob was the same for Esau. They both received circumcision, and only one of them remained in covenantal faithfulness and obedience. Jacob. Esau apostatized from the covenant and rejected God. And Hebrews has some words to say about that. So how shall we then live? Well, the Belgic Confession, Article 34, says this about baptism. And I want you to notice it. I'll read it a little slowly so you can catch it. It's not long, but this is what the Belgic Confession says. Our Lord gives us what is signified by the sacrament. Okay, he gives us what is signified by the sacrament, namely, the invisible gifts and grace. When you partake of the Lord's Supper, when you've been baptized, God gives you something that is invisible, meaning it speaks to the heart. It goes underground to the root of who you are. Okay, it goes on. He washes, purges, and cleans our souls of all filth and unrighteousness. And there's some verses there. We're going to look at some of them in a second. Renews our hearts and fills them with all comfort. Gives us true assurance of his fatherly goodness. Clothes us with the new nature. And takes away the old nature with all its works. That's what baptism does. The basic reformed position on baptism is that it is efficacious. It is efficacious. It does something. Baptism with water accomplishes something. It isn't merely external. It is tied to the internal workings of the Spirit. I have a smattering of verses for you here. In Acts 2.38, we find that Peter proclaimed this, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice Peter says, repent, be baptized, you'll have forgiveness of sins, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the train of thought here. Repentance followed by baptism issues forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Spirit. When faith is exercised in tandem with that baptism, okay, and infants can exercise faith in seed form, just look at Psalm chapter 22, 9 and 10, other verses David speaks of having infant faith. It can be there, but when faith is exercised in tandem with baptism, God uses it in a special way. The rite of baptism then incorporates the baptized individual into the family of God, into the body of Christ, and it is there that God's people share in the gift of God's Spirit. In Acts 22, verse 16, and by the way, later, if you have a phone, just search the word bapt baptism or baptized, and you can see all the verses. It's all over the New Testament, but especially in the book of Acts. 
But in Acts 22, 16, Ananias told Paul, rise up, because Paul is rehearsing his, his conversion story here. And later he does it, and it happens in Acts, and then later he rehearses it. But he tells Ananias, rise up. This is what Ananias said. Rise up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. That's what Ananias told to, to Paul, who was, remember, he was blinded. Rise up, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So repentance, baptism, cleansing, faith, entangled together. 1 Corinthians 6.11 tells us that in baptism, you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. 1 Peter 3.21. This is perhaps one of the more controversial verses. But he furthers the concept here. 1 Peter 3.21, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. <laughs> what does he mean there? Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal of a good conscience to God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what Peter says about baptism. And these texts... All of those emphasize for us an important aspect of what it is water baptism actually does. Namely, it washes away the dirty conscience. It judicially removes sins, paving the way for sanctification and justification. And when I say that water does these things, it's not the water that does these things. The water points us to the spirit who does these things. So God is at work in those things. It, the Belgic Confession says, it cleans our souls of all filth and unrighteousness. Ephesians 5.26 speaks of Christ the bridegroom cleansing her by the washing of water with the word. So the water and the word go together. The water is applied to the head, which represents the body, which spiritually speaking touches the heart. Um, people have fought over, do you do immersion? Do you do sprinkling? Can you do pouring? Um, I don't think that the, our Baptist brothers and sisters have it totally correct by s insisting that the Greek word baptizo means immersion. Uh, John Murray, I think, destroys that argument handedly, frankly. But the reason that oftentimes pouring or sprinkling happened on the head is because the head in Scripture represents the body. And it doesn't take long to see where that comes out. Uh, you have a husband who is the head. He represents the family. He represents the family as that body. Uh, just like Christ is the head of the church. He represents the church in that regard. Now, in 1 Corinthians, Paul explains the corporate nature of baptism. All Israel, chapter 10, verse 2, was baptized into Moses. When they crossed the Red Sea, they were baptized into Moses. And, and in chapter 12, verse 13, he says, For also by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. When you're baptized, you're brought into the body of Christ. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. That was 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Galatians 3, 27 says that we who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So there's this language of putting on Christ, like clothing, like a garment. In baptism, it, you are putting on the garment of Christ. And we also know that there is one Lord, one faith. There's one baptism in Ephesians 4, 5, which means that there is also one body and one spirit. There's a unity there. See, when one is baptized, he or she is brought into Christ. You're brought into the body. You're incorporated into the family of faith, the community of the redeemed. The, and, and I want to emphasize this too. The act of baptism is God's sign to man. All right? It's God's sign given to man. It is not your sign to God. You know, come to my baptism and look how awesome I am. <laughs> As, it has really nothing to do with your testimony either. Because your testimony could be a lie. You could be bearing false witness against yourself because... People have been deceived and blinded by unbelief. You can partake of the life of the church and go to hell. 
because you have unbelief in your heart and not faith and do all the external things, right? So it's not your sign to God. It's God's sign to man. And, and again, immersion is not necessary. Sprinkling, according to Ezekiel and Hebrews, does the job just fine. The head is what we're looking for here. Now, and I said this earlier, infants can possess faith in seed form, and they are to be baptized by virtue of the covenant, being members of the covenant, and by virtue of God's promises to the family and the generations that follow in true faith. So the promise is for Christian children too. And when a child is baptized, the mark of Christ is put on them as well, so that later on they are to their job is to grow in the covenant. Children, that's your job right now. You're just to grow up into the covenant, to, to see and take of communion, to partake of the, the body of Christ, to be here as the people of God. You are part of the church. You are members of Christ. And, of course, you need to be trained by godly parents, but the, the training is so that you children, your baptism will match your profession because as you grow into this covenant, we want to make sure that those things are, are harmonious here. So the, the, the son or the daughter, his baptism, like mine and like yours, parents, points to Jesus. So his life, like my life and your life, parents, is to point to Jesus as well. So baptism reflects the gospel. It imports the promises of God in Christ. So the life of faith must be nurtured lest we charge God with being a liar. Now the, the Lutheran, I'm going to pick on them too. Why, why not? We love them. Uh, the Lutheran position is usually expressed in terms of baptism itself creating faith in someone. So when you baptize a baby, that act is creating faith in the child. But the reform position is that baptism nurtures the faith that is already there, even if it's in seed form. And again, Psalm 22 is a good example. So through faith, the, bapti the baptized child grows to internalize they need to internalize the objective status and the Trinitarian identity that was given to him or her through baptism as someone who should be considered a member in the church. In the church. So children aren't to be considered secondary members. Oftentimes in many churches, that's the case. They're just secondary members. We'll, we'll cart them off somewhere else in the building, and, and that'll, be it. that'll be it. But they should not be viewed that way. They are members as well. They're members of Christ by virtue of baptism, and they too must walk through the doorway of water baptism. Now, to be clear, to emphasize this, baptism is an effective rite. Effective. It brands us with the triune name. That's Matthew 28. It washes us from sin and confers on us the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, 38. It brings us into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That's Romans 6, 1-14. It joins us in the spirit-filled body, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It clothes us with Christ, Galatians 3, 27 through 29. Baptism regenerates in some spirit-centered sense, by the way. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. And Peter does tell us that it saves, 1 Peter 3, 21. Now there's a mystery here and how that works itself out. But we know that faith is involved Covenantal promises are involved. The Holy Spirit's involved. And water baptism is a part of the formula. So baptism is participation into... We're, we're, when, when we're baptized, we are anointed as priests and kings, right? We are members of one another. And baptism is the participation of the work of the triune God. So when you have water applied to you in this way, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we have a new identity when we are baptized. We have a brand new identity. The Father makes us a family, the Son makes us servants, and the Holy Spirit makes us missionaries. You have been tasked with something in that new identity. And that's because baptism is eschatological. Baptism is eschatological. The first fruits of the kingdom are given to us. When we rise from the watery grave, we are brought forth into a new body. And that new body is the body of Christ, the church, where the Holy Spirit resides and flourishes. Baptism is an initiation rite into God's kingdom, and the church, we know, is the outpost sent forth into the world. 
The Lord's Supper, tied to it, is a renewal of baptism's eschatological trajectory. When you are following Christ, you were given water baptism, and now you partake, and that takes you into the future. Baptism, we'll remember, was prefigured at creation when the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters. It was prefigured in the worldwide flood when that took place. When, and it also when Israel left Egypt in the great exodus, there's echoes of baptism in the Old Testament. When we're baptized into Christ, we are baptized into the whole Christ. The whole Christ. Everything that speaks of Christ is now ours by proxy. You have been given everything that Christ possesses. He is all and in all. In its present tense, it's a real-time sign of the gospel. Now, we're wrapping up here, but I want to get a little bit more personal with you. People are generally quicker to believe that the universe speaks to them. This is our culture today. The universe aligned, and it told me, you know, how exactly? People are generally quicker to believe that the universe speaks to them, that Mother Earth controls the weather, um, that vibes can be a substitute for prayer, sending positive vibes. I don't know how to do that. But they're quicker to believe that than they are to believe that water baptism means what the Bible says it means. And if, and if we're going to treat these glorious sacraments, these covenantal rites and signs and seals as though they were inconsequential to our normal day-to-day, then it should not surprise us to learn that our suppression of the Holy Spirit's means of maturation and grace has personal, familial, and societal consequences. And it does have consequences. Let me say it another way. If the church is going to treat the baptism, the water, water baptism, and the Lord's Supper willy-nilly, like it means nothing, and it's just something we kind of do, but we don't understand it, we just do it, you should know that it has personal ramifications, it has ramifications for your family, and look at our culture today. Right now, we have sweeping apostasy happening in our nation because people have abandoned their baptisms. A lot of people, I see them at George Mason all the time, they grew up in the church, they were baptized, and they live like atheist hellions now. And they don't care. But we're dealing with somebody who's in the covenant. They're just violating the covenant right now. And they need to be brought back to faith. But they've abandoned their baptism. They have walked away from it completely. And I think the church has abandoned her scriptural obligations as well and has settled for an insipid, milk toast version of Christianity. Martin Luther said this. This is condemning. When God intends to destroy, he gives them leave to play with Scripture. And if we're just going to play with Scripture, that's a judgment from God. Because we have not taken the sacraments seriously, because we have not administered them righteously, because we have divorced the sign from the thing signified, and because we have abandoned God's covenantal imperatives, we are seeing cultural decay take place i think as a direct result of that as the church goes so goes the nation and what i want you to do and this is where i'll leave you that i want you i want you to treasure your baptism i was 10 years old baptized in sells pond in seneca michigan a mucky pond um i will never forget that day But I have to confess that oftentimes I go without thinking about it. We need to treasure our baptism. The Trinitarian name is branded on you. The gospel has been imprinted on you. And you must love this new creation identity. Love what your baptism represents. You must treasure what your baptism means. And do not despise it. Do not resent it. And that's, parents, what we're doing with our kids. We don't want them to resent their baptism. You've been given all of this. Enjoy it. Love it. Grow in it. The the future has been given to all of us in our baptism as as a deposit sealed by the Spirit to the glory of God. And baptism means that you are, eschatologically speaking, what God says you are in Christ. You are what God says you are. So abide in Christ by loving your baptism. 
loving what it is God has done for you thanks to the work of Christ. And, and water is thicker than blood in God's kingdom. Water is thicker than blood. And you possess the name of God, so, so act like it, right? Stay loyal to it, embrace it, uh, adore it, love it with all that you are, and be reminded of your baptism every single day to the best of your ability. Your baptism is yours, so treasure it. Treasure the water. Treasure the fact that you've been plunged into the blood that came from Emmanuel's veins. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the work you have done in us by your Son and by your Spirit. You have given us so much, and oftentimes we have either been presumptuous about it or forgetful about it. And I pray that you would keep us from those things. Keep us from trying to find an identity somewhere other than in the baptism you have granted to us. Keep us from trying to... to please people or to, to, to be in a situation where we're trusting in, in these other outcomes rather than in the outcome of baptism. And I pray that you would teach our children to do the same. Father, we, we ask that you would protect our children from the ways of the world. May they be nurtured in faith. God, strengthen our parents so that as they teach and educate, they would be able to impart the gifts of what baptism represents. And so, Father, we rejoice in what you've done in your Son, and we thank you, Holy Spirit, for being with us, for changing our hearts, for renewing us, and may that work continue even to the end of the age. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.